In the first half of the 20th century, mankind witnessed warfare at a level beyond what anyone could imagine. Two world wars would alter the course of civilization forever. In Europe, peaceful woodlands and pastures became horrific battlefields. Cities, once thriving with culture, were reduced to ruins. Over the course of two wars, 1.7 million Canadians left their nation to defend our freedom and the liberty of others. In the end, 116,000 would never return. As a generation of Canadians who witnessed the horror of two world wars passes into eternity, who will continue to care for the memory of those who were killed in action? I think it's always um, extremely important that people remember what young men did and also to remember that um, at the end of the day, uh, young men died. Uh, you know, war is not a glorious thing, it's a horrible thing. And it's nice for, for many people to come to this uh, cemetery and see what Canadians did, you know, for Europe, what they've suffered and what a lot of people suffered. The graves of Canadian military personnel killed in action lie in finely maintained commemorative cemeteries. Their headstones, with the iconic maple leaf engraved in white Portland stone, signify yet another soldier who would never return home. Unlike any previous conflicts in history, thousands would lose their lives while at sea, in the air, or in the trenches. The changing methods of warfare presented new challenges to those responsible for the remains of servicemen killed in action. The overwhelming number of casualties experienced during both world wars challenged the notion of whether a country should bury their war dead in foreign lands. Though many families struggled with the thought of burying their loved ones overseas, it was decided that a fellowship in death that crossed all boundaries of race, creed, or wealth would be followed. And through the duration of both world wars, every soldier killed in action was buried overseas. During the First World War, Fabian Ware, a British major, arrived in France to take charge of a Red Cross mobile unit. While caring for the casualties brought in from the surrounding battlefields, he became aware of the lack of organization involved in recording the graves of soldiers. As a result of his efforts to honor the memory of the fallen, an organization known as the Commonwealth War Graves Commission was formed. Today, the Commission is responsible for the care and maintenance of over 1,700,000 burials in 149 countries. In a sense, it's like passing on the torch because it's not just about working for an organization, it's about working for a whole movement of people who are committed to um, maintaining the memory of those who gave such a great sacrifice for all of us. At every Commonwealth cemetery, visitors will find familiar features, like the cross of sacrifice rising over neat rows of headstones. The simple limestone cross symbolizing the spiritual faith of the majority. And the sword on its face, representing every cemetery's military character. In cemeteries containing over a thousand burials is the Stone of Remembrance, designed to commemorate those of all faiths and none. The phrase inscribed in the stone speaks for all, 
their name liveth forevermore. It's almost very um, meditative coming here and, and spiritual, and I love the fact that they've taken such amazing care of this place here. It's just every single grave, each beautifully manicured with flowers and pictures and flags. It just makes you feel proud to know that they obviously cherish it, and we love that they cherish it. When Germany invaded Belgium in 1914, young Canadians rushed to enlist thinking the war would be over before they arrived in Europe. Soon, thousands of troops were heading for foreign lands. Every community in every province across the country awaited news of their young fighting men overseas. And for many, the news they received from the front was devastating. In Northern Europe, hundreds of thousands of soldiers fighting in miserable conditions were forced to dig in and wage the brutal battles associated with trench warfare. The war would not end quickly, and as a result, vast numbers of casualties were sustained by both sides. During the First World War, one out of every three casualties would succumb to their wounds. Many Commonwealth soldiers who died on their way to hospital or at casualty clearing stations were buried at cemeteries located not far from the front lines. Leesenhoek Military Cemetery is the second largest Commonwealth cemetery in Belgium. It contains the graves of over 10,000 soldiers of the First World War. A distinction of military hospital cemeteries is that soldiers' remains were buried very close together. It is common to see entire rows of headstones where the relationship among soldiers isn't necessarily country or regiment, but that they were one of many that died in hospital on that day. Over 1,000 Canadians are buried here. Many who perished from wounds suffered in famous battles, such as Mount Sorrel and Passchendaele. Private Charles Labrador, a Mi'kmaq native from Nova Scotia, was killed while serving with the 25th Canadian Infantry Battalion. Only 20 years old, he died of his wounds on the 27th of July, 1916. When I first found his grave, it was um, really emotional for me uh, to be able to uh, travel over there and find my great uncle who I always knew had been killed. But um, to see a Labrador amongst all those uh, grave and headstones was, was really emotional for me. And also, I'm the only one in my family that I know of that ever went over there and actually went to his grave. Like many villages near the front lines of the Ypres salient, Vormazella, Belgium, was completely destroyed by relentless artillery fire, while each side fought to control the area. The high number of casualties and the continuous fighting led soldiers to bury their dead in often appalling conditions not far from the battlefield. Today, the cemetery seems to be just as much a part of Vormazella as the homes that line the quiet streets. Just over its walls in all directions are the backyards of the town's residents. Buried here is Carl St. Clair Walker of Dartmouth, Nova Scotia, who served with the Canadian pioneers. He was killed in action on April 11, 1916. Uh, I was told that uh, he had already been wounded and they were bringing him on a stretcher to the first aid post and that a sniper had shot two stretcher bearers and also shot him through the heart. The first time I visited his grave was in uh, 1978. I had been posted to Germany in 77, so my mother had come over and we went to visit his grave. And it was the first time anybody from the family had visited his grave. The few possessions that Carl carried with him were returned to his parents, and they remained cherished by his family. The one postcard was sent in March of 1916 to him, and he was on him person when he was shot. When you see it, the corners are cut off it because his blood had soaked into it, 
and they didn't want to give it to the family that way. At dawn on April 9, 1917, over 100,000 soldiers took part in the Battle of Vimy Ridge, an event that has become etched in the Canadian psyche as one of our finest military achievements. Numerous attempts by the British to capture Vimy Ridge had earned the German position a reputation of being unconquerable. The four Canadian divisions, who were operating together for the first time in the war, captured the heavily fortified position within days. On the north side of Vimy Ridge lies La Chaudière Cemetery. Among the 908 Commonwealth burials lies the remains of 638 Canadians who gave their lives during the vicious fighting of April 1917. La Chaudière's finely maintained brick walls and majestic maple trees mark the boundary of the quiet country cemetery. Visitors who pay their respect near the Cross of Sacrifice will identify the twin white columns of the Canadian National Vimy Memorial in the distance. A reminder that victory was not attained without a great cost. One of the 3,598 soldiers killed during the assault on Vimy Ridge was Private Campbell McCaskill of Cape Breton, Nova Scotia. Serving in the Royal Canadian Regiment, he was killed in action within the first hours of the attack. Private McCaskill was only 22 years old. Located at the highest point of the ridge is the Vimy Memorial. Today, one can still see the pock-marked ground, a result of the relentless artillery barrage that preceded the Canadian offensive in April 1917. A portion of the Canadian and German trenches have been preserved so visitors may appreciate how close the front lines were. People picture this vast expanse between the two trenches, but it's tiny. And just looking across the expanse today, you just have to picture people trying to cross it. The fact that there was no trees, no grass, it was just mud, and then they would see the bodies in there and know that if they tried to cross, that that might be them. Miles of tunnels lie beneath the grounds of Vimy Ridge, one of which was occupied by members of the Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry on the night before the historic battle. People are down there for 36 hours in silence and darkness. You can only imagine what was going through their heads, what they were thinking about when they're hearing all these bombardments, and to have the energy as well as the courage afterwards to go up and try to take this ridge I think is something that's admirable and it's why I'm here today and telling their stories. Engraved in a tunnel wall is the familiar shape of a maple leaf. While the fate of the Canadian soldier who carved the symbol is unknown, his work lives on to symbolize the beginning of a nation's identity. The monument that now dominates the ridge is the focal point of any visit to this historic site. Adorned with impressive sculptures, most poignant is the figure of a soaring woman. Carved from a 30-ton block of stone, she represents Canada, a young nation who is mourning her dead. 